Hi, this is Steve, and I want to welcome you back to another Tech Leader Talk discussion. This interview is part of the Space Tech Innovation Event, where Space Tech leaders are sharing the latest trends and key insights that you can use to grow any kind of tech company. The event is free, and you can register at spacetechinnovation.com, where you get access to all the audios, the videos, edited transcripts, and an executive summary for each interview. Today, I'm talking with Sean Buckley. Sean is the Senior Director of Engineering at Sierra Space, where he and his team are developing and implementing the next generation of power and infrastructure systems for the evolving space economy. Sean is passionate about space systems, especially inflatable space habitats that he talks about on today's call. He loves attending design reviews. He considers it a privilege to participate in the design review process, to see people's work, and to see their excitement in the projects that they're working on. So during the design reviews, Sean enjoys seeing all of the hard work done by the hundreds of team members. And on today's call, he's also talking about well, the mentors that he's had in his life and the way that he himself mentors uh, younger team members as part of his current work. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy this discussion with Sean and you get some valuable insights about working with your own team members, regardless of where you are in your organization. So let's get to my discussion with Sean. Hey, Sean, thanks for joining me today. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about, I know there's, at least from my initial public research, there's kind of three different big categories that Sierra Space is involved with. What are the kind of those three platforms or those three systems, which you mentioned earlier before you started recording, that, that they actually do all integrate together. It's, it's part of a, an overall system. Well, Sierra Space really has three main sectors. Uh, you have our transportation division, which does the Dream Tracer, the space plane, which mm -hmm. is just an amazing technology. I know the availability for us um, as a country to be able to launch a space plane into space, dock with the ISS, and then come back and provide those types of services and watch it land. You know, it brings you back to the shuttle days, right? How yeah. the exciting part was watch the shuttle land. Um, and then also now to be able to service our own space stations, which is the other sector that we have, which is called destinations. And destinations develops our habitation systems. So we talk about the life habitat, we have a, an airlock, we've got a series of um, components that generate a platform in space. And then we have a third sector, which is our applications division. The applications division develops our ecosystems, solar arrays, uh, they do thermal systems, propulsion, um, just an amazing team. So we have all these three different sectors, these three different synergies, which really give us a complete space ecosystem. It allows us to have each one of the primary areas that you can be successful in space. Okay. Interesting. So the space plane can fly up to one of the habitats that you've created, which is right. both a, a solid structure, but then also some of your inflatable modules to that. So that was, I'm an engineer and I see all kinds of new technology, but when I saw this idea of inflatable, I saw an article there recently about me doing pressure testing, well, how much pressure could it take before it would fail? That seems completely new to me, completely revolutionary. Is, is this something you're just, you're building from scratch or was somebody else try this in the past? Well, NASA, NASA established an inflatable system called TransHab many, many years ago. Okay. And in TransHab, they started to invest in a technology to build lightweight structures. They could pressurize and get maximum volume. The key discriminator in inflatables is you take an inflatable structure and you pack the structure and then you put it inside of a rocket ferret mm -hmm. and you launch it in space. Well, when you launch it in space, it arrives in space, you inflate it, and it gives you all this additional volume. So your launch to volume ratios are exponential. So you can design it into the system. Mm -hmm. I get comments all the time, well, you're sending something up in space, which is inflatable. Should I be nervous? Um, our systems are extremely yeah. robust. We have micrometeor orbital debris protections called MMOD. So if you're going to get a, um, if something's going to hit the outside of the spacecraft, we have orbital debris protection, which is out there, which is stronger than steel. We've done what's called hypervelocity impact testing. It gives you a high resilience against high speed objects that are going to hit. Um, when you pressurize the inflatable, 
our pressure shell, which you saw in the videos, right, which we blew up, um, you know, we, we get in there, go maximum pressure, and we want it to explode. We want to see that failure point. Um, I've personally been able to go up to articles like that, take a sledgehammer, and hit it with a sledgehammer while it's pressurized. And the sledgehammer just bounces right off. Mm. Um, it's an amazing technology. Um, our base component, which is out in the web right now, is Vectran. And Vectran is a really, really strong material. Um, and that Vectran material gives us the capabilities to be in space and survive in space for over 60 years, a performance value which is really needed. Wow. Interesting. <clears throat> so how do you... I talk with a lot of people about innovation and lots of tech companies. They, they live and die by the innovation. This is kind of extreme innovation because you're doing something that yeah, you can't go look at 18 different examples and see how they've done it. How do you and your team, how do you kind of approach innovation when it's something so new and you don't have some of these previous ideas to fall back on or to learn from? Well, uh, you want to leverage previous technologies which have a relatability to it in tech. Okay. So if you go back to, let's say, the textile industries, there's, a way that you, there's ways that you strengthen textiles. It's a warp and a whiff. It's how you're going to uh, okay. weave them together so you can get higher strength characteristics. How do you take that component level, bring it into a subsystem, and then bring it into a system? And how do you generate those performance values through your standard engineering, right? You're going to take a look at material performance properties. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to go through and do your analysis. You're going to see how it performs at the lowest base to the highest mm -hmm. base. But there's also something else that we do at Sierra Space where it is all ideas are on the table, which is really important. Creativity. From the earliest engineer to the most seasoned engineer, they all have a voice at the table. And we expect everyone to have that voice. Um, the goal is for us to listen and not speak as much. When I say listen, it means go into a room, sit, and yeah. see what everybody has as far as their opinions and be like a sponge. Soak it in. I give this great example. I was working on a project once. And we were trying to figure out how to safeguard an area of the spacecraft from pressing a material against it. We we're all talking about it for days and days and days trying to figure it out. We we're coming up with all these complex ways of doing it. And one of our youngest engineers walked by, looked at it, and goes, oh, you guys should put tape on there. And we all looked at each other and said, yeah, you know what? We should just put tape on there. It was the <laughs> simplest thing to look at because we had blinders on. We were so focused on the issue. We didn't see that other innovation. Mm -hmm. It really woke me up to listen in the room and then see all the opinions and then see all the different amazing ideas that the young, mid-career and experienced career engineers have, and then assess them and see what brings the most value. Well, I'm sure you've probably experienced too. I work in a lot of brainstorming sessions and someone will say something. We have the rule, you know, no criticizing because any idea can springboard to something else. Yes. Somebody mentions something and they're like, well, that's not very feasible. But if we took your idea and just twisted a little bit, so without that first idea, even if it wasn't feasible or wasn't right. maybe it wasn't the greatest idea, it triggers us in somebody else's mind. And you, you know, four or five, or 10 rounds later, you've got an amazing invention. So. You've got an amazing invention. And that's what we really push for at Sierra Space. Okay. Um, design reviews are absolutely amazing for us. I mean, I, I get so excited about going into a design review um, and having the opportunity to review the material. I always indicate to the designers, They've done all the heavy lifting. My role as senior director of engineering or chief engineer, I get the privilege to go in and look at the hard work that they've done. The worst thing you can do having that privilege is going in there and ripping it apart. That's not your role. Your role is yeah. to go in there and create enthusiasm for the work that they've done. Indicate mm -hmm. to them that you're very proud of the work. It might not be applicable to what you're doing right now, but great job. Because that little bit of praise, that little bit of enthusiasm, is far better than going in there and just criticizing them sure. over the work they've done. Yeah. Give them positive feedback. And that's yeah. really what we'd really try to strive to do. Okay. Yeah. Validate their work and validate what they're, yes. what they're promoting. Very critical. Or yeah. contributing. So how do you handle, I don't know how remote your team is, but you know, a lot of tech companies, well, they've been remote for years. I've worked with clients who have offices in the United States, uh, Asia, India, and those teams, <laughs> they're, sometimes time zones that are 12, 14 hours different. Hey, how do you get people in these technical topics where collaboration is important um, and to get multiple viewpoints? How do you kind of manage that? What do you go out of your way to do to make sure that the collaboration is as strong as it can be? Well, first thing we tell everybody, turn the cameras on. So if you're on a video, right, turn your cameras on. We want to see your face, right? I want to see the individuals that are presenting or see the individuals that are in the room. We also make sure that everybody's a key contributor. If you land in the meeting, you're going to get called upon. 
We're going to talk with you. We expect you to give feedback. Um, we don't want you to be in, you're not supposed to be in the sage coach if you're not going for the ride, right? If you don't have a place to go, don't, don't get in the sage coach. We don't need you to take that ride. It's really important yep. to be part of it. Um, you're talking to me right now. I'm in our Centennial office, which is in Colorado, Centennial, Colorado. You know, about 45 minutes away, we have our El Dorado office. Um, we travel back and forth between those offices. We have offices in, you know, Madison and Wisconsin. I travel out to those offices. We bring that team out here for major design reviews. Um, it's important that we support each other. And the way you support is engagement. Uh, we bring people in the office. We emphasize in office community in office interactions mm -hmm. we understand that we want flexibility with people that are that are working for our company and we give them the flexibility you can work at home you can work in the office you can you can move your meetings around the days that you're in here but get in the office have that collaboration and then communicate with teams that are not directly around you like i said get on the the teams meeting get on the zoom meeting turn the camera on see each other's face um, i'm also a firm believer that if i get a message on an im I don't shoot back a message just on the IM. I hit call and I call them because that voice to me is really important. Right? I can, I can sit there and type out six sentences in there and I'm like, I'm not going to type six sentences. I call them. And you should see, sometimes they're surprised. They're like, oh, hey, Sean, I, I thought you'd just send me an IM. I'm like, no, let's talk a couple minutes. Yep. Um, it's the engagement. It's the mentoring. You know, as yep. you move up in, in through your career, mentoring is really huge for me. I had incredible mentors as a young man. They got me where I am. Um, so I believe in paying it back. So part of that communication is part of that mentoring. How do I talk to the young engineer who says, I just want to work from home all the time? I go through a scenario and explain to him, working from home all the time, you're going to lose that face-to-face -face of that physical interaction. You're going to lose that, those certain skills that you develop by working and being in a meeting yeah. and being nervous when you go and sit at a table, right? When you go in that first design review and you're a young engineer, oh, I was so scared to death, right? I'm sitting down there and everybody's looking at me, can I do this? Um, first couple, I failed unbelievably, <laughs> but best lessons learned, right? My, the best successes are your worst failures. Um, mm -hmm. So we try to really emphasize test quick, test fast, fail early, fail often, but get in the office and do it. Okay. I, I've talked with a lot of people who are, who are mentors and I, I mentor people myself, but do you find it just as beneficial to you as to the mentee? Oh, 100%. I, um, mm -hmm. My, like I said, my my road is less traveled. Um, to most amazement, I didn't go to college for what I'm doing right now. Um, I went out, I, OJT, on the job training. Mm -hmm. um, I read as many books as I could read. I set myself a goal, 52 books a year. I wanted to learn as many drawings as I could. But the biggest impact I had was a gentleman whose name was Joel Bergman. He passed away um, a few years ago. And he was uh, the godfather of architecture for casinos, for tall high rise. You see a 3,000 room hotel. He created the Y concept, which was the elevators in the center. And then you have wings that come out from the elevator. So everything's in the central core. Mm -hmm. He took me underneath his wing. Um, and I was so lucky as a young man trying to make sure I could take care of my mom and pay her bills. I just couldn't go to college. And um, he brought me in and had me come into the office early in the morning, had me stay late at night. Um, taught me about architecture, taught me about um, HVAC, structural, electrical, all kinds of things inside there. And it was just such a privilege. So when I see a young engineer um, and they say, hey, can you mentor me? I'm like, yeah, that's fantastic. Because like you said, it is a two-way street, right? Back and forth. I learn from them, they learn from me. Um, and I think it's, I just think it's a, it's a privilege to be able to do that. And you should do it. You should reach out to mentor to people. Mm -hmm. um, had a huge impact on my career. Throughout my yeah. life. I agree. I've had some amazing mentors that, that I still think of every day, right? I end up in situations like, well, what would Ken have said in this situation or something said, like that? I yeah. say that quite often. Yeah. I yeah. think back cool. and go, okay, what would Don say? Okay. Don <laughs> would tell me, kid, you need to focus on this, you know, because I was always called the kid. So, the kid. Was, of course. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, cool. what? So I mentioned earlier, I saw the, the video, the press release, uh, I guess the article that was out about. Yeah, pressure testing the inflatable habitat. What other kinds of testing and simulation do you do here on Earth to you know, maximize the likelihood that everything goes well in space? Because going up to space to test things is expensive and time consuming and sometimes it's not workable. It's <laughs> not workable. You know, we have we are lucky enough that NASA has been going through this process for years. 
right? So, so leverage what NASA's past experiences and published papers really provides you a strong path moving forward in how you mm -hmm. test, especially habitable volumes. Um, you want to test in an environment that shows you like performance. I, there's a saying that we use, or I use a lot, which test as you fly and fly as you test. So test as you fly. So take the design that you have, design it to a flight-like design, and then test it. And I get asked this a lot. How do you test in the environment? There are certain systems which need environmental testing, and then there are certain systems that don't need environment, that don't require that. The way that we augment that is using ground support equipment, right? GSC. You can use a piece of GSC to simulate an offloading or an environmental test by offloading part of the structure you have in a vacuum environment or in a zero gravity environment. Mm -hmm. You have to be really innovative um, on how we approach things. People have asked me about the burst test. Sean, you just went out and burst test a structure but it was burst test on terrestrial and not in space. How can you correlate those values? Well, we do that based off of material performance. And the material performance at the component level, at the strand level, as it's integrated into the system, we create you know, string charts. And those charts look at those performance values. And we have historical values on materials. We correlate that together to get a known performance. That known performance gives us a data point. And then we do our next test, and then we get another data point, and then it gives us a correlation of where that system is going to perform. If it's required that it has to be in a vacuum environment, or let's use this as example material outgassing, right? We've got to see if a material is going to extrude any type of materials which will damage um, objects in space. Well, we take that and we do an outgassing test on it. We take the material, put it into a chamber. We simulate the environment and we watch the materials come out of it. If there are materials that come out of it, we do a bake out of it. We bake out those materials prior to putting them into the system. So again, that's how we augment that known performance in space. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I told the audience a little bit about your background and some of the cool things that you're working on, but tell us how you got there. One of some feedback I get from the audience is they always want to hear people's kind of story. How did they get here? Especially when we're talking about space. Is this something you dreamed of since you're three or four years old? Did you fall into it? How did you get to what you're doing today? Well, I always say mine is a road less traveled. You know, I, um, I started out in the architectural industry, uh, worked in the hotel industry, basically designing large high rises, um, large hotels, uh, things in Las Vegas and around the world. And in 2009, I owned a company which did design work. And the economy took a tank. If you remember 2009, 2008, industry would really hit pretty hard. And when things like that happen, you have to reinvent yourself. I've always been a person that believes in design and creating and building. I'm very hands-on. Um, and I had an opportunity to join a company in Las Vegas, which was Bigelow Aerospace. Really had no idea what they did. I just heard space and I heard they built habitats and put things in space. So how cool is this? I have already designed buildings. You know, I've, I've been working on a lot of large structures. How hard can it be to work on space structures? So I ended up landing in Bigelow Aerospace and just fell in love with their technology. You know, um, I geeked out every day. You know, I would work on large buildings previously, and now I'm working on inflatable habitats, habitats that would go into space. And Robert Bigelow um, got his hands on this type of architecture, which was from NASA had started, and he was really accelerating the design process in it. Um, and I ended up spending uh, 12 years at Bigelow Aerospace, just really following in love with that technology, the inflatable habitat technology. Mm -hmm. um, from there, you know, working at Bigelow Aerospace, I had the chance to um, be part of the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, which was the first inflatable launched in space and put on the International Space Station. And I moved through a series of positions inside there. I started as a supervisor. Um, and within about six years, ended up making it to vice president, which in charge of soft goods, uh, their manufacturing, their engineering, basically designing their, their soft goods systems really focused on the inflatable. Um, when the company decided to no longer be in operation, um, about three years ago, um, I decided to go to Lockheed Martin, which was going to be in developing some of their systems. And I was there mm -hmm. for about 18 months. Uh, and then I saw an incredible opportunity when I saw what Sierra Space was doing with their inflatables. I had been a fan of SNC for years, seeing what they were doing with their life habitat. And when I saw it transferred over to Sierra Space and the investment that they had in it, um, I knew it was a place to be for inflatables. Um, and it's really where my passion is. Um, I love engineering uh, the inflatables. I love the entire inflatable systems. Um, you'll talk to me about soft goods, but I also have a strong background in the mechanical systems and the ecosystems, which are the environments, propulsion systems, um, solar, power, thermal regeneration. 
all mm -hmm. of those areas I'm really interested in. Okay. So these different systems that Sierra Space is working on, you can you have have your platform where they they integrate some. How do you fit into the overall space ecosystem and all the other things that are being manufactured out there and designed? You, out there in the world or just in Sierra it, Space? It just just more kind of like in the space world, make, uh, with with other companies or other technologies that you're not involved with. How do you kind of integrate with those? Well, the great thing about Sierra Space is we're building a platform in space to benefit life on Earth. That is really our mantra and what we state. And when we okay. state that, that means we're going to put a platform in space and you're going to have a place to get a go to to do um, microbiology, right? To develop pharmaceuticals up there, to do advanced material testing, mm -hmm. to put um, individuals up there, right? Astronauts to be able to live in space, to be able to work. But the other benefit of this is all the materials that we develop up there, every advancement that we make has a benefit for life on Earth. So how does it fit into the ecosystem? It fits into the ecosystem is that we provide that platform to create those benefits that we can use on Earth, which are across platform. If we have a new semiconductor that can be developed in space, and it's developed in space, it's lighter, quicker, faster, and higher performing, that net benefit as it comes down to Earth is exponential. And we're looking at all of those platforms, how we can do that. Okay, interesting. It's fun to see a lot of that going on. I've talked to some other people talking about the new drugs that are be de being developed uh, on the space station because zero gravity, they can make drugs that they can't on Earth or even uh, human lenses, new eye lenses for their eyes with zero gravity. I guess I assume they come out perfect things without bind any better, distortion. Right? Yeah, things bind better. Things at a molecular hmm. level you know, form better in space. You're not being pulled down by gravity. Yeah, okay, interesting. So you mentioned earlier that you're, excited about what you do and it comes through and when you when you talk about this every day <laughs> but as a senior director of engineering at sierra space what's the favorite part of your current work oh design reviews really? absolutely unequivocally okay. design reviews you know i like i said earlier um i get the privilege and i always i've always deemed this as a privilege as you move up in your positions with inside of a company or in any part of your career the opportunity to review people's work uh, their hard work, their heavy lifting, um, it is just an amazing privilege. Again, I was I sat in two design reviews today. I was driving into work today. Someone was driving into work, and um, I was so excited when I got here because I knew at nine o'clock I was going to be in a design review, and I knew who was giving the design review, and I knew how well he does design reviews. So I, I was sitting kind of giddy sitting here and, and somebody walking up, hey, Sean, I go, hey, happy, happy Monday morning. <laughs> and I'm just super excited about it because um, one, we're doing something that not many other companies are doing. I mean, we're doing habitats in space, very limited field. Two, I have the privilege to be involved in it, which is always just a blessing to me. Um, and three, I get to see all the hard work that is done by so many team members, hundreds of team members. Um, it's just amazing. So, I mean, best part of my day, design reviews, hands down. Okay. So what's what's the exciting part? Is is it something new? They come up with things you never have thought of? And you're like, these, this is amazing? Or just to see that kind of the process works and these teams are collaborating to come up with these fantastic designs? Uh, it's both. the excitement. It's the excitement of the engineers. You know, the derivative of They're the excitement excited. of the engineers is the product. But when yep. you can go into a design review, and I've got someone that's been six years into their career, and they're working on a key component on our life habitat, which is basically going to make sure our structure stays together and can survive launch. And their passion behind it, um, it's my job to make sure they stay passionate and they keep pushing that technology forward. So for mm -hmm. me to land in the meeting, um, I, I remember in, early in your career, I would go into a meeting and have the senior architect inside there and I was a draftsman. And I'd be like, as soon as he would talk, I would just be in tune with him and just wanted to hear every word he said because he was a legend. He was a senior architect in our firm. Um, when I go into the meeting now as a chief engineer, senior director of engineering, I can see the look on their faces. All they want is five minutes of time and just for me to react to it. So I believe you have to heavily engage with them, meaning yeah. I want to talk with them. I want to see what they're doing. I want them to understand that this is Sean. Here's the human side of me. I made 10 decisions today, seven were good, three were bad. I make mistakes also. But the key is go make those decisions to get things moving forward. And again, okay. listen to what they have to present. Yeah, and support them and realize and support yeah, them. designs of the, the process. Tools. It just keeps iterating. And this is just yes. one, one point in the iteration. 
sequence. That's it. Yeah, yeah. One, one design review that's going to be hopefully many and many, many more. Yeah, you know, it's going to give us that and results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what economy is a little wonky right now. What, what do you see as the big challenges uh, to the space industry? Uh, Sierra space, but, but maybe the industry in general. Supply chain. Supply chain yeah. right now is one of the biggest challenges that we see in the industry. Um, it's supplies... Uh, for our components, which have to be space rated, we're seeing, um, you know, it used to be 12 months. Now we're seeing 18 months. We're seeing two years. Wow. We're trying to mitigate um, that net effect. We're trying to buy components early with inside of our design phase. We're trying to support our suppliers, you know, and provide them with the capabilities to be able to order their raw materials sooner. Well, you okay. do bulk buys of raw materials. So that is not our holdup in our supply chain. To me, that's that's the biggest concern that I have with what we're trying to build. Getting the components, getting our vendors to have the capability to be successful to provide us with those key critical components. They're all struggling right now. Yeah. And that's got to be frustrating for you, wanting to design it. It's like, we're ready to go. We got We want to test it. And you can't even get the parts. Are you sometimes... That's part of our due diligence. So we we have a system to where we identify those key components early in our design. And we've been in communication with suppliers for over a year, um, talking with them on how we can help accelerate it, whether it's decreasing the design's performance, the complexity, uh, value cost engineering into it so they can understand the performance values of the materials that we would need, um, decreasing um, the level, like I said, the level of complexity, the number of requirements, simplifying the process. Um, just because it was done that way 10 years ago doesn't mean we're going to continue to do that way. Is there a way we can improve it? Right. Lighter, cheaper, faster, stronger. Yeah. You know, those are things that we look at. So are you in a situation sometimes where you only have a sole supplier? Because if it's something really specialized, you, you can't are, have are, multiple. <laughs> yeah, there are times where we're like that. And um, we support those suppliers, right? We try to sure. become the enabler to make sure that they're going to be successful. Um, at the end of the day, we partner in this. If we pick a supplier, that's a big deal for Sierra Space, right? We've selected you as a supplier. Um, we're going to support you as a supplier. And that support means that we design together. We help you mature components together. We understand the process and system together. Um, that's really important for us here at Sierra Space because this is a partnership. Uh, we're, we're not going to put a, a habitat, a space plane, or build a new ecosystem without working very closely with our suppliers. Mm -hmm. And that's key for us. Yeah. Well, I noticed lots of projects in space are, yeah, they take, it's not just multiple suppliers, but sometimes it's even multiple companies. You know, the multiple companies come together to build rovers and, and different things like that. But yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. Well, is it improving at all supply chain issues or are you managing them better? Uh, we manage it. We have a really robust system in, inside okay. Sierra Space. I'm seeing other companies improve. Okay. Um, you're adjusting to the market. So sure. if you would have asked me this question five years ago and someone would have said, hey, this board is going to take you 24 months to get, I would have said, you're crazy. It's not going to be 24 months. I've got a supplier and get it in eight. Now, when they say it takes 24 months, I'm like, can we do it in 20? You know, can we pull it back four months? And again, yeah. years ago, you would ask me, I said, can you pull it back to six months? We adjust our schedule, our needs, our design, how we integrate the product. Um, if we're ordering something which is 24 months out, we have a complete integration system. We make sure that we can integrate it at that 24 month period, where in the past we might integrate it at 18 months. We swap out different parts and components. We might integrate a system prior to that, and then that long lead system gets integrated later. You know, mm -hmm. we're just changing the way that we're doing our IMS, our integrated master schedule, and how we're shifting those priorities around to make sure we can be successful. I think all companies are doing that right now. Okay. <clears throat> Things are always changing. I, I suppose I read about all the new types of manufacturing techniques, 3D printing, additive printing, and all kinds of other things, I suppose, as the type of materials that they can print with that technology that, that could help you too down the road, potentially, as long as the raw suppliers, materials are in supply. <laughs> suppliers have definitely uh, adapted to new technology, and that's definitely shown us benefits in several areas. What used to take weeks and months on certain metallic components can get done much faster now by um, higher performing five access machines, you know, for, for, for machining and milling. Yeah. Um, metallic printing, right? 3D printing. Uh, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have a large end 3D printing machine in your office. And today at Sierra Space, we've got several of them. And you can get components on a daily basis so you can reevaluate designs. Yeah. Um, it's really, 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 it's an amazing time to be 
part of the space industry, any design industry. Yeah. Yeah, being able to do quick in-house prototypes, even if they're not structurally the same, at least you know, for fitment and other things like that, it's, it's valuable. Okay. Yeah. So what's ahead? There's a lot of exciting things going on there at Sierra Space, but what's ahead kind of for you and your team in the next year, two years? Uh, really maturing our our technology, our systems, you know, going through our design process, uh, getting through all of our initial and major design reviews. Obviously, mm-hmm. on the soft goods or structure side, more testing. Right, we're going to be doing um, some additional testing this year and going into our first full scale habitat testing. Okay. So we're going to do our first full scale burst test sometime this year. Um, we are doing um, internal system evaluations. So we're creating systems and going through uh, what's called a, like a first system checkout. We're defining systems to look at their performance values. Um, really just a lot of hiring. We're bringing a lot of staff on board. Uh, we've got a, our programs are growing. Our company is growing and we need to bring on the right talent at the right time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got new facilities opening up. Uh, we're just expanding left and right. It's a really exciting time to be part of CR Space. Good. That does sound fun. <clears throat> it's a lot of fun. You mentioned earlier on a slightly different topic. You mentioned earlier that you, at least in the past, used to read a lot of books. Um, I do too, and I always love to get new book recommendations. What's a favorite book you've read recently? Ooh, fiction uh, or nonfiction? Your choice. Uh, um, Courage is Calling. Okay. Just calling. Uh, I believe it's Ryan Holiday. Um, and I, I, I like Ryan Holiday has a has a series of books called The Virtues. Um, it's his virtue series. And um, I enjoy his books because it's about inspiration and it's about um, failing and then getting back up off the ground. He really puts it in, in a, just an amazing way. Um, okay. I really, I, I connect with that. Um, I'm a, I'm a person that says, you know, you need to fail often, fail early, fail often and learn your lessons. You know, life's life's best lessons are your worst failures, right? <laughs> Falling on your face really teaches you how to fall on your face and then how to get back up. I um, learn from it. Yeah. And courage is calling is really just a great book. I think I've read it three times right now. Uh, um, there's okay. different quotes in there for, you know, Marcus Aurelius, which was basically, um, you know, this, the Caesar of the time, um, Caesar poet. You know, and he installs the four virtues inside there and talks about the four virtues, you know, courage, temperance, um, those types of things really resonate with me. And it provides me that that guiding light when I'm working with fellow engineers or when I'm trying to learn, um, do things and do new things. In fact, I, I keep, it's funny, I carry the books around with me. Um, I've got a new one that I just got, which is called Talent is Overrated. I'm super excited about reading this one. Um, it's by uh, Jeff Colvin. Um, it's going to be an amazing book. I, the reviews were just unbelievable. And this is about, he takes a look at um, what, what's the difference between world-class performers and just having talent. And is there that separation between somebody who just is, you know, you look at somebody like a Michael Jordan, you go, man, he is so talented. But look in the background, he shot, you know, a billion shoot, you know, into the hoop, right? And he got talented over the time of doing that. Yeah. Um, what did it take to get that talent? Um, <laughs> I'm always enthusiastic to see what it took for people to get where they are. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I actually haven't heard of either of those. So but those are great I, books. Yeah, I, I highly recommend Courage's Calling. Okay. And it's just such a great book. I'll add those to my reading list. I'll also put a link in the show notes to anyone who's who's interested in looking, taking a look or read at either of those books or listen. What's a, this is a great conversation. I knew it would be. I love your background. I love Appreciate talking it. about all these things and um, in your experience and your insights, that's it's very valuable uh, to the listeners. I know they got a lot out of this. What's uh, if people have questions or if they want to get in touch with you or learn more about Sierra Space or job opportunities at Sierra Space? What's the best way to to reach out and connect? LinkedIn is the best profile, um, okay. and I respond very quickly on LinkedIn. Um, and I think also Sierra Space social media. Uh, you should go if you want to learn more about Sierra Space. You need to go to a Sierra Space website. We're also on Twitter, Facebook. Um, Instagram, um, go on there and take a look. There's different postings that happen after we do our testing or just updates in the company. The okay. CR space is very um, social media forward. So you'll see posting out there. You'll see updates to what we're doing in our systems. But again, you can reach me through LinkedIn. Um, it routes straight to a, to an email from my account. Um, and I typically try to respond in about 48 hours. Okay. Um, I'm a huge, I'm a huge <laughs> quick responder. Um, I try to respond 
48 hours as fast as possible. I know we were going back and forth on getting this set up. Like we kept responding back and forth. Um, and I'm glad we finally got an opportunity to do it. Yeah, I'm glad it, it happened. It worked out. So I will get links uh, both to your LinkedIn uh, profile as well as uh, the website and maybe some of the social media links too in the show notes. So anybody who's listening and wants to reach out, they've got it all handy. Um, I know you're busy. I know you got a lot of design reviews. So I appreciate you taking the time to squeeze me in and, and share your knowledge with us today. Well, I've always enjoyed, um, I've enjoyed what you do, your podcast and your background. So I really felt it was a privilege that you just reached out to me um, to say, hey, be part of this. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so okay. much. Well, great. Okay. Thank you. And we'll stay in touch.